Hello, this is Wafa Halam from Inside Arabia. I am extremely pleased to welcome Susanna Bulhawa today to who joined me for this chat. Um, I'd like to first introduce her properly. Susanna Bulhawa is a Palestinian American author. She was born in Kuwait to Palestinian powered pa parents who were made refugees in the 1967 war. Susan is a renowned auth writer, author, and poet. And fa in fact, I think Susan, you say that you have written poetry before you wrote anything else. So you are actually a poet. Um, her first novel, Mornings in Jenin, was an international bestseller with rights sold in 26 languages. Along with The Blue Between Sky and Water, she is most recently the author of Against the Loveless World, a finalist for the Aspen Word, Words Prize and winner of the 2021 Palestine Book Award and the 2021 Arab American Book Award. Inside Arabia has published reviews on both Mornings in Jenin and Against the Loveless World. I want to mention that Susan is the founder of Playgrounds for Palestine, an organization dedicated to upholding Palestinian children's right to play. Last but not least, Susan is a human rights activist and an advocate for Palestinian rights. She is a frequent political, a political co commentator. And in fact, Susan, ha, I first heard you speak at the 2019 conference uh, by the Washington Report for Middle Eastern Affairs in Washington in 2019. It was on March 23rd, 2019. I was in the audience when you delivered uh, your powerful keynote speech titled Israel Beyond Apartheid, more than two years before B'Tselem and Human Rights Watch published their reports in 2021, declaring Israel to be a full-fledged apartheid st state. They were recently joined by no other than Amnesty International. Um, so my first question is, first of all, it was the first time during that conference that I heard someone talk about and mention the word apartheid to my great chagrin. I know that Palestinian advocates have for a long time spoken of that. And in fact, um, Jimmy Carter had written a book, you know, talking about that and he was ostracized. Um, how do you feel about what's happening today with this human rights organization um, joining in the chorus of voices? So, um, yeah, I'm, I most certainly wasn't the first one, I mean, to, to, to utter that. I mean, Palestinians have been saying that for a long time, and so have um, uh, South Africans who lived under apartheid and uh, went to Palestine, and most of whom, like um, Desmond Tutu, said it's actually worse than apartheid. Um, and in many ways it is. You know, I... I, I posted a tweet the other day that, you know, not even in their most depraved hour did um, the apartheid government, you know, uh, uh, do some of the things that Israel is doing. Like, you know, they, they never bombed uh, or, 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 or rained death um, from the sky onto the townships. And, and you know, in South Africa, um, <clears throat> people who, South Africans who lived in the townships, black South Africans, uh, they, they had, you know, when they were in their own communities, they, they could exist, right? They could live in the, you know, they weren't, the police didn't come in basically to those townships in the way that the military does to Palestinian areas. Um, and when they did, I mean, they were mostly scared, <laughs> you know, it was much bigger spaces and stuff. So. Um, people at least, you know, were able to, to live their lives with, within their families and communities and not have, you know, white settlers constantly um, attacking. And so in a, in a lot of ways, it is, it's much worse. Um, and in, in part because the, the landmass is smaller and the encroachment of, of, you know, white supremacist settlers is, um, is far more pervasive. And present in every every moment of people's lives, you know the um, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and even Bet Salem, you know, finally coming on board. I mean, of course, it's a welcome. It's these are welcome uh, developments, but it should be clear that these organizations arrived at these. Uh, at these stages, at these conclusions, 
because of unrelenting Palestinian struggle, right? Because we, because our struggle made it unavoidable for them to tell the truth, right? Because, yeah. you know, we, it, it's because, because of Palestinian resistance, because of our inability to accept this oppression and humiliation, it's because Palestinians continue to fight in every way possible as, as is Palestinian right to do so. Because we continue to fight and struggle against this cruel occupation, um, you know, there was, the, you know, the, I think they, they could no longer continue um, in the silence, right. ignoring, because for many years they did. Right. They did. And, you know, this isn't yes. what, what they've described in these reports is nothing new. Right. It's yes. stuff that's been yes. going on for literally decades. Yes. It has advanced over the years, but there's nothing new, really. I mean, you know, Israel maybe introduced the nation state law, but otherwise yes. everything is, is consistently been the same. Um, and, you know, a lot of Israelis will say, you know, uh, I think there was that Shin Bet, former Shin Bet leader or something who said, um, you know, I'm ashamed to shame my, ashamed to say now my country, now my country is an apartheid state. But the reality is, no, it's always been this way. Always been. You know? yeah. yeah. And we've always been telling you and nobody, but nobody listens to Palestinians. Nobody believes us. Well, um, because, because yeah. wouldn't you say, I mean, uh, as Hasbara or uh, Israeli propaganda has been so dominant so, um, I mean, masterful in the way it was denying and silencing the Palestinian narrative. Um, so, you know, it, it was harder for Palestinians' voices to be heard, because especially that they were able to uh, use this, you know, uh, threat that, it, that they were always the victims and that they were victims of terrorism and the Palestinian with the terrorist state or the terrorist actors and so on and so forth. So that's how they actually gained this kind of recognition from most other countries. Yeah, it's, it's more than that too. I mean, there's a lot of um, white supremacist racism too, because, uh, you know, Israel is formed by white Europeans exactly. and uh, you know, take, for example, the Tantura massacre. Palestinians, yeah. people who lived through it, survivors have been telling the story. Yeah. We have been telling, our historians have been telling the story of Tantura. Yeah. And of course, Israel's been denying it. Only recently, this year, when they uncovered a mass grave under a parking lot, yeah. did, did it come, to, did they have to, you know, were they forced to admit, yes, there was a massacre in Tantura? Um, and so now it's like, oh, now there's agreement. There was a massacre in Tantura. But you, do, do you see what I mean? Like it's- ah, absolutely. Um, it, it isn't, yeah. I mean, Israeli Hasbara has a lot to do with it, but it's it's also, you know, we could we could invest if we had the money, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, do the same kind of uh, truth tell. We could do truth telling, not propaganda, but it still wouldn't reach people's ears because we're the brown people in this, right? Yeah. We are, we're the Arabs. We're the so-called backward people. Yeah. I mean, so you see this even so like- Islamophobia involved as of well. Of course, yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, actually, you know, with, with, the, uh, with the crisis in Ukraine, you see this kind of um, uh, double standard, you know, racist standard basically on full display with this total, um, outrage and incredulity, incredulity that um, that you know the, the people that are dying are white. Yes, <laughs> you know, exactly. like yes. these reporters are outraged, saying, "This is Europe. We can't believe this. This is in Iraq. This is in Afghanistan. Yes. These are civilized people." I mean, that's literally a quote from the you know. Uh, Degada, the, the CBS reporter. Absolutely. They don't see us as civilized. They don't see us as, um, as, as worthy of life and yeah. liberty. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's because I believe, uh, don't, you, don't you think, um, Israel has allowed the narrative to be one-sided, very much so. And they have also played on the fears of the white man 
about this so-called you know islamic terrorism they have continued to feed that narrative they also have been buying um approval from other states by selling as you so well described in your talk in your keynote speech uh, uh three years ago um how they were selling intelligence and uh, arms and uh, training to uh, not only police department throughout the US, but to uh, authoritarian regimes throughout uh, South America, Eastern Europe. Uh, and in fact, as been confirmed lately with the NSO and Pegasus um, stories, this is going very far. These are all things that they are using to, to buy votes at the UN, to allow more states to, to align behind them and silence any dissent. In America, uh, most congressmen are that afraid to mention the word Palestine because of the backlash. How can we overcome that, would you say, would you think? How can we overcome this? You mean, so you mean overcoming Israeli Hasbara? And <laughs> yes. I mean, look, I mean, we have been, right? We have, like, it's, you know, when I was younger, you couldn't say the word Palestine um in public right people would be afraid to to do that it's the you know it's the incremental um it's the incremental advancement it's the incremental um resistance and it it all adds up right we have been uh even you know as a writer you know i'm we write stories right we yeah. we tell we we tell our narrative in every avenue possible um, we t we have to ensure that our story is told in in journalism, and it's hard because you know U.S. media in particular is um, very Zionist. Yes. yes. But I want to I I want to emphasize that you know we're talking about the West right now, and I I you know when I live here that's true, but I really think that the more important people to talk to are the countries that are seemingly without power, the people who are our friends already. Um, you know, African nations, for example, South American nations, people who have stood with us from the beginning. I think we make a big mistake in, um, uh, in, for, in, in leaving them, right? And in, in, uh, in not paying attention to them and thinking that the only people um, that we need to work on are Westerners because the, you know this is where the seat of power is. But you know, and this is something I've written about um, a lot in the past. The fact is that you know Europeans um, and Americans, especially white Americans, are they're not our friends, and they've never been, and I don't think they ever will be, because because. Racism is so is so deeply rooted in European society. I really believe that it is in, it is inextricable from from their national character and their national and their identity. That, that yeah, sorry. Yes, go ahead. I was thinking um, in my lifetime. I think I have seen a progress in that in that uh, department in terms of, for instance, what uh, the, the rallying cry around the Black Lives Matter, how many white Americans in particular and, 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 and in Europe as well, have begin, begun to become increasingly aware of racism and uh, bias and discrimination. And I think that the Palestinian questions, especially since the the, the, the the recent the May 2021 uh, uh, co conflict in uh, Jerusalem and the bombing of Gaza has created a new awareness aided by the spread of social media. Wouldn't you say that there is, that more and more white people are actually joining their voices to the Palestinians? So, so I, think, I think we have to distinguish between um, between pity uh, and true solidarity and allyship, right? African countries historically have stood, they have been our comrades in arms at times. 
as have South American countries. In, in the West, Palestinians are depict, are understood in one of two ways. We are either terrorists, we're crazy, irrational terrorists. And that's generally on the right, you know, right-leaning people, that's how they see us. On the left, including the people who advocate for Palestine, we are seen as uh, desperate, pitiful um, uh, uh, people who are, who are struggling and need help, need rescuing. We are not seen as, as comrades. We are not seen as people with agency, people with a culture, people with deep roots, people with, with high functioning individuals with great talent and great intellect. We are not seen that way. So it is one thing for Westerners to become more aware of what's happening to us, mm -hmm. but it is another thing for them to, uh, to see us as, as a fully formed human society population that is just as smart, just as talented, just as capable with as much potential as they have. I think that is the element that, that is almost always missing in Western societies, unless, unless it's, it's, it's the black and brown part of those societies. Well, Even, you know, becoming aware of racism is very different than, um, then it even, you know, you, you were talking about BLM, it's very different than um, accepting black people as, as comrades, I you agree. know, as family. Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. I agree. But I think there are many elements in this society and others. And I'm thinking about um, uh, organizations like Jewish Voice for Peace and others that are truly mm -hmm. invested in, uh, in, in this question. I don't think that they just pity uh, the Palestinians. These people actually have sometimes been divorced from their families and alienated from uh, you know, their parents because- Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not denying that. Um, so, I, you know, there, and the same thing happened in the civil rights movement. You know, a lot of white people were actually killed by, by the Klan mm -hmm. for, for standing in solidarity. But you're talking about you're talking about individuals, and I'm talking about systems, right? right. Okay. Humans as individuals, we're capable of anything. Mm -hmm. But on on a, on a collective, systematic level, is what is what I'm I'm talking about. And even within, like, so JVP, I see honestly, I don't, I see their commitment uh, is actually is as it and should be to Jewish liberation from Zionism. That is their task. Yes, they honestly. do. Yes, it is. Right. Um, yeah. Actually. It is not, it's not, you know, I mean, J JVP um, are and, and should be allies, right? Not, not people at the forefront of the Palestinian struggle. I, I think that that's how they see themselves. Honestly, yeah. Uh, yeah. Susan, I mean, they, they, they want to be allies. They always give, I mean, I just yesterday was listening to- um, I think their work is great. I think what they, they've had so many amazing campaigns. Like for example, they have the Deadly Exchange campaign, yes. which has been tremendous and amazing. Yeah. But again, like you're talking, I mean, JVP represents, unfortunately, a very tiny portion yeah. of of American Jewish of the American Jewish population, yeah, they yeah. are a minority, um, and and also you know we shouldn't forget that that JVP only very recently rejected Zionism, so you know even even as a tiny organization as an on the organizational level, it took them this long to actually reject Zionism and to understand that. Zionism is is the problem as an ideology. Oh, I think that that's exactly how they see it now. I mean, if you listen to people I, like Peter Beinart, for instance, he is not he's not part of JVP, but everything I read um, from him seems to be 
truly advocating and not just out of pity, but out of just human rights and justice and, and so on. But I, I agree with you that really it is a, a, a very much a tip of the iceberg and so much more needs to be done. Uh, yeah. Let me tell you something about like folks like Peter Beinart. Like he's a, he is a Jewish American person. He only very recently sort of came to new conclusions Correct. that are closer to justice. He is someone who has zero ancestry in Palestine, like like most Israelis. Like most, yes. He's an American of European descent. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure he can trace his lineage, you know way back to Europe, nowhere near the Middle East. Right, yeah. And yet, Peter Beinart presumes to have a say in so-called solutions to our liberation. So this is something I absolutely reject. Peter Beinart has no say and should have no say. He, you know, people like Peter Beinart should be, should should be committed to educating American Jews, to educating their own community and figuring out a solution to, to their own predicament, not ours. Right. That's, that's how, so, so I don't really, you know, I don't care what Peter, Peter Beinart says. Right, right. I don't care what any Zionist says. I don't care where they are in life. I, I care about the Palestinians who are, who are on the ground, who are in refugee camps, who languish in exile. Our people are far more impressive. Our, our comrades in oppressed nations are far more dedicated and committed. And I, and this is my point. I don't, we, we spend way too much energy and we give way too much value to people like Peter Beinart and other white people in the West. We get, people get so excited when, you know, when, a, when a white Jewish person or a Jewish or, a, 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 you know, an Israeli person yeah. decide that, oh, wait, you know, yeah, I think you guys are actually telling the truth and you're suffering. I don't care about those people, right? you know, and, and I think, they don't see them as allies and as something that we, you want to build on? How? No, how? not not for me. Not for me. No, I like I said, I, I'm not interested in those people. In like, I have zero interest in, in speaking with Peter Beinart. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm really interested in speaking, uh, um, you know, with uh, with Mandela Mandela, for example, mm -hmm. Nelson Mandela's grandson. Right. You know, I'm interested in speaking with, um, uh, you, you know, with, with Berta Caceres' uh, successors in her struggle. Mm -hmm. I'm, inter I'm interested in speaking with indigenous leaders. Um, you know, somebody who just decided that Zionism might be wrong is not on my level. Right. They're not. So, I mean, so and what, they're not worth my time as far yeah. as I'm concerned. I, I know that, you know, telling the stories and telling them, but what are we trying to achieve though? Aren't we, uh, aren't you trying to win hearts and minds by telling the stories, you know, of the human stories, the people behind the conflict? Um, what is that? Yeah. What, what, I'm, talk, no, no. I'm talking to my own people. My stories I write for I I write with I write with a loyalty to the characters and my characters are Palestinian and that means that my loyalty and my my audience my primary audience are other Palestinians. I'm writing for future generations. I don't believe that any Jewish leader, that any American leader, any any of these people are going to liberate us. I believe that our own that, that our, libera our liberation will come from Palestinians. We need allies. We always need allies and they're important. But it, I, it is not my job to try and convince 
people that we're human. If people want to re see, see, this is the thing I think there's this mentality that, um, that it is, that that's like a lot of people tell me that, well, because, you know, there's some things in my books that some people might find offensive and I'll say, well, you know, why'd you, why did, isn't that going to alienate somebody? I don't care. I'm not, I'm not writing for them. I'm writing to tell a tr truthful story. I'm writing for Palestinians. I'm writing for young people to know where they come from, to know what was done for, to us. I'm writing for them not to forget. Yes. Right. Those are, those are the, the those are the readers that I care about. I don't care if Peter Beinart reads my book and, right. and likes it. He doesn't matter. He does not matter to me. If he does and he likes it, that's great. But I really don't care one way or another. Right. Um, so, and that goes for, you know, um, it goes for everyone really. You know, honestly, the only, <laughs> I mostly don't really, you know, I love it. You know, of course, I mean, like every writer, I really love it when people write to me and say, I love, love your books and, and so forth. That means a lot to me. But, um, but I'm not hurt by people saying they hated it or whatever. Yeah. But I can be hurt. Actually, I would be hurt by Palestinians saying that it was awful and it was terrible. And right. I mean, if they say it for the right reasons, you know, <laughs> if, if, you know, I mean, I think some Palestinians maybe don't like the sexuality or something. And that's yeah. something I'm, I'm very comfortable with. And I, you know, I, I accept that criticism, but, um, you know, I'm not, again, I'm not writing for, for, for those folks. Right. So your advocacy is really, um, focused on achieving just more greater awareness among Palestinians, first and foremost. How do you then come to terms with the kind of political divisions within the leadership? So first of all, you called it, you, you, you called it advocacy. Um, writing a novel is, is, a, is, is, is creating yeah. art. Right. It's, not, it's not advocacy. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, we are, Palestinians are an ancient uh, society <clears throat> with ancient traditions and art and culture and history and folklore and dance and music. You know, we are not uh, our, uh, we're not, our value and our, and our existence is not and should not be measured in proximity to, um, to Israel and what's happening with them. Right. Um, so like every writer from every society, I'm writing our stories, right? Because it's part, because, because we're, we're a fully formed society who have writers that write stories. I mean, it is as simple as that. It is, it is as simple and um, as beautiful as that. Mm -hmm. um, I am also an activist, right? Yeah. And my activism is not about uh, trying to convince Westerners to like us. That's not my act activism. My activism is confronting them. Okay. okay. It is their job. Mm -hmm. It is the job of white people, of white Americans to make themselves better, to make themselves less racist yeah. and more understanding. Mm -hmm. And we have books, we have stories, if anybody's ever interested in looking at our lives. That is their job. Well, uh, you humbled me because I really, I, I'm, uh, I don't think I've ever heard someone speak so uh, eloquently about what it stands, what, the, what does it mean to resist, if you will, to resist this, this occupation, to resist this uh, human tragedy uh, in those terms. I understand, of course, you're more than an artist. Your writing is absolutely sublime and really you know I didn't mean to say that your writing was uh, ac activism but um what I I meant is your other um uh, I understand the other side of your of your work yeah. is to be you know an advocate and an, and an activist um I really 
value you the point of view that you just made it actually i've learned something <laughs> and i appreciate it very much because you know it is true that we always look for salvation from outside when in fact salvation mm -hmm. begins with oneself and so uh perhaps it is because it feels like as i said uh, the palestinian leadership seems to be so divided um and so that that you know, it, it's sometimes really frustrating and infuriating uh, to see how things are not moving, you know, farther than they are. And so yeah, it's true that the first yeah. instinct is to look for, you know, allies and look for outside ways to... Uh... And we do need allies, right? But it's different to... So this is, you know, this is a condition um, of of colonized people, right? It's not, it's, and I see it in my own family. I see it across the Arab world. I see it in African countries. We are looking for, um, we're looking for others. We're looking for leaders. We're looking for, we're looking to our former colonial masters to, you know, to do something for us. <laughs> yes. You know, because, there's this sort of generational trauma um, that has taught us not to believe in our own power. Right. And, and we don't, we do not instinctively look to our children as we should, right? Yes. We should look to our children and the next generations for salvation, not to, not to Europeans, because, right. because here's the thing, it is never going to come from them. Our yeah. liberation, our salvation is never, ever, ever going to come from France or England or Germany or the United States. It, that is just not going to happen. Right. And I think, and it, it, it is baffling to me that this very, this very logical and obvious thing is so, um, is, is just so unseen. Yeah. And unrecognized. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, educating Ghanaians and um, Nigerians is far more important than um, uh, uh, you know, than, than trying to educate Americans. Um, because, because I feel like people who've been colonized, first of all, you know, the, those countries have traditions of supporting us, right? But people who've colonized have a different understanding, right? You don't, there's, you don't have to, you don't have to go through so many layers, right? There's a mutual recognition. Like there's a reason why, you know, in this country, for example, Black people, even who, who, you know, Black America that maybe doesn't even have a historic perspective on what's happening in the Middle East, right? They don't have to know the history or know the region or know the maps to instinctively know something is wrong, right? Black Americans instinctively are pro-Palestinian because they, they look at images and they see themselves, right? Black Americans instinctively and overwhelmingly oppose the war in Iraq um, because yeah. they have, they recognize themselves. Yeah. So, you know, I think, um, I think we, I think these things, I think we should, th I think these things, especially in the Arab world, world really should be discussed more um, and more openly because, um, you know, we, people don't feel their own agency. You know, I think with the Arab Spring and this miraculous, uh, these scenes from Tahrir Square really, I think, started to make Arabs feel like we do have agency and we do have collective power. And our young people are, are amazing, right? They're better than us. Um, and I think, you know, but that has kind of fallen back. And, but I think we have to cultivate those sentiments. We have to believe in our own children um, and our own, our own gen next future generations. 
um, and not continue to invest so much of our time and our energy into the West. I appreciate the, the solidarity and especially when it's genuine and real and those and those and there's like there's people here in the United I mean, I'm, I'm a member of of a communist organization um, and I feel they are true solid they are true comrades to Palestinians um, but again these are minorities in, in in the United States and the US is a big place and there's you can find pockets of uh, of real com real solidarity Right. But on the systematic level, it, this is still a very hostile country to us. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But we, you know, I happen to be here, so this is where I have concentrated my struggle. Yes. Right. Well, um, you certainly have made your point very clearly, and I really, again, as as I said, I really appreciate it because I don't think we hear it often enough. Uh, said in those terms uh, with so much clarity and certainly correcting some of my own misperceptions about where the struggle should and uh, you know should come from um yeah so i thank you very much susan <clears throat> I'm not thank you. Much longer. and i want to really thank you for you know um for reading my books and being so kind and so generous um and just you know showing up for another arab woman like i think um you know, that's part of the struggle too, right? I mean, that, you know, strengthening, strengthening our sisterhood, right? Yeah. Strengthening the Arab sisterhood is part of a, a larger liberation struggle. And in, in my opinion, and I think you absolutely. exemplify that. And absolutely. Um, yeah, you do. And I, and I thank you for that. And I'm you know and that it's honored to meet you. Thank you. Do you know that inside Arabia is actually all women? <laughs> We're all women. Yes. Good. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a women team uh so thank you very much susan you have a wonderful day i appreciate you your too. time and uh your explanation were fascinating i wasn't at all expecting it to go in this direction and i'm thrilled that you actually <laughs> opened uh, my perspective to uh you know to to this this point of view and i really really appreciate it you have thank a beautiful you, day you too you too take care bye <laughs>